This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by HelloFresh. Forget takeout. HelloFresh delivers all the ingredients for delicious, healthy meals anyone can prepare at home in less than 30 minutes. And HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to HelloFresh.ca and use promo code REALITY50 to get 50% off your first order. That's HelloFresh.ca, promo code REALITY50. This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show for Tuesday, May 23rd, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? Christina Roach. Hello. And producer Pat. Hi, everyone. We have three interesting segments for you today. Adam is going to look into whether humans migrated to the Americas 130,000 years ago. That's right. And then Christina is going to explore whether wearing red makes you more attractive. But first, I will look at whether paper burns at 451 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, how clever, Darren. Does that have anything to do with the fact that this is our 451st podcast episode? What a coincidence. Oh, Oh, wow. (laughs) Who would have thought? Yes, Christina, in honor of this episode and based on a suggestion by Adam, I thought I would examine whether paper actually burns at 451 degrees Fahrenheit as indicated by Ray Bradbury's classic novel, Fahrenheit 452. (laughs) (laughs) That was the sequel. (laughs) It was. It's overrated. My copy has one of the title pages saying, Fahrenheit 451, the temperature at which book paper catches fire and burns, dot, dot, dot. For those who haven't read it, the book follows the life and thoughts of a fireman named Guy Montag, who lives in a dystopian world where books have been banned and firemen don't put out fires, but start them to protect society from the dangers of reading. In Celsius, that rounds to about 233 degrees, by the way, for Canadian listeners. Uh, What is actually meant by catch fire? Here, the concept of auto-ignition temperature, or kindling, is being used. According to Wikipedia, that is the lowest temperature at which something spontaneously ignites in normal atmosphere conditions without an external source of ignition, such as a flame or a spark. Mm -hmm. The temperature is required to supply the activation energy needed for combustion. So what is the auto-ignition temperature of paper? Happily, Brian Palmer at Slate investigated this very question, and he had some interesting takeaways. First, there isn't a definitive value on this number because experimental methods differ. But it's more that the auto-ignition temperature of any solid material is a function of its composition, volume, density, and shape, as well as its time of exposure to the high temperature. Further, air pressure and oxygen concentration matter as well. As you may know from a match inside an upside-down cup, it'll eventually just go out because there's not enough oxygen. Mm -hmm. Different paper burns at different amounts, where a sheet of paper in your oven would take much less time to catch fire than if you put a textbook in there. Huh. Textbook you hate. (laughs) Oh, yeah, like a school book. As well, the paper in glossy magazines is relatively dense and coated with a thin layer of plastic. And because most plastics auto-ignite at higher temperatures than paper, this type is a higher auto-ignition temperature. But there really isn't a lot of experimental data on this. As well, Palmer found that newspapers have an auto-ignition temperature a few degrees lower than filter paper used in chemistry labs. Yes, yes, Darren, but what's the auto-ignition temperature already? (laughs) Turns out it was close to Bradbury's book title. Palmer links to a 2011 textbook, Fundamentals of Combustion Processes, which I highly recommend. (laughs) It's more of a page-turner than Bradbury's novel, because it's so dense you don't understand most of it, so you keep turning the pages. (laughs) hi (laughs) oh. Anyway, this book puts the temperature at 232 degrees Celsius, which is about 449.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty close. That said, Palmer says that there have been more recent experiments that put the temperature closer to 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Which is about 249 degrees Celsius. Hmm. That said, the Wikipedia page that talked about the auto-ignition listed the range of paper as 218 to 246 degrees Celsius, which is 424 to 475 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is your answer. In short, 451 makes a good number. It seems to be right in the middle, and it's definitely the temperature at which some paper burns. And it it just, it kind of has a nice ring to it, like 451, like you hear that number, and like I saw it on the episode number for our our show, and it immediately evokes, you know, Fahrenheit 451. Well, let's say, but does it now have a nice ring to it because the book came out? Maybe. It's hard to see in isolation. Now, the obvious follow-up question is, sure, but what about e-books? 
Well, <laughs> well, NPR talked to Theo Gray, a columnist with Popular Science, who said that there will be different components, the lithium polymer batteries, the organic solvents, the plastic casing. It's hard to measure, but somewhere around 1,000 to 1,500 degrees. Wow. We'll assume Fahrenheit. That said, apparently lithium polymer batteries make quite a show when they catch on fire. How so? Theo Gray said that he collected a bunch of old laptop batteries and grilled them to set them off. <laughs> and they'll shoot like a rocket 100 feet in the air, shooting flaming balls behind them. Wow. Although on the grill, it would have been exposed to a direct flame because he's not getting a 1,500 on his barbecue. Exactly. And there you go. Tune in next week where I'll talk about the book 1984 and fact check whether it happened in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, it didn't, and I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting the title of the book is Fahrenheit 451. But like Guy Montag doesn't use he doesn't use just heat against a book to make it burn. Like he, he shoots kerosene and flames out of this big flamethrower to light these books. I thought so you were gonna say he uses disdain also. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's 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 like I think that the fact is mentioned in the book, but it isn't really how they burn the books in the book. The book's in the book. Yes, they don't just raise the ambient temperature of the earth high enough that all the books <laughs> catch on fire. <laughs> Whether you're looking to burn paper or perhaps aid in human migration, fire is helpful. But did humans migrate to the Americas 130,000 years ago, Adam? Great question, Darren. A few weeks ago, my fiancé was reading the paper and mentioned an article stating that humans were in North America some 130,000 years ago, whereas it was previously considered to be about 15,000 years ago. What a gap. What, I asked, was the evidence. Human remains, tools, or some other artifact? Well, there were some mammoth bones that were crushed in such a way that suggested it was done by a man-made tool. Needless to say, I was a bit skeptical. Reading a few articles on the subject, I wasn't terribly convinced by such simple and indirect evidence. Darren suggested I check out a New York Times piece by Carl Zimmer, and this contained some great analysis, which I used for my segment. The current scientific consensus, at least that which predates this study, has modern humans leaving Africa over 100,000 years ago but not coming to the Americas until less than 20,000 years ago. This is a huge difference from 130,000. One would expect that we don't know everything, but if we got some new evidence of earlier migrations to America, it would at least be in the 20,000 year ballpark. So why do we think it's less than 20,000 years? Well, there's a lot of different converging evidence, archeological, geological, anthropological, and DNA studies that lead us to this. During a glacial period which peaked around 16,500 to 13,000 years ago, there was a lot of water frozen in glaciers, which lowered the level of water of the oceans enough that humans could cross the Beringian land bridge from Siberia to Alaska. Earlier archaeological evidence of humans in America dates usually to between uh, 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. Genetic evidence is mixed, but suggests that human migration to Beringia, that's between Siberia and Alaska, was either between um, about 25,000 and 30,000 years ago or about 36,000 years ago, depending on the source. Geological evidence suggests that while humans were in Beringia, they wouldn't have been able to cross to the Americas at the time because they would have been stopped by enormous glaciers. Migration to the Americas would have either been between 10,000 and 15,000 or 20,000 years ago, depending on the specific genetic research. Beyond this, migration out of Africa is considered to have been done between 50,000 and 80,000 years ago. Modern genetic testing shows that human ancestry throughout the world can be dated back to a single migration out of Africa occurring roughly 50,000 years ago. Though there were some migrations which predate this time frame, these aren't the ancestors of modern humans. So some migrations that happened, but those, there are no real descendants from them. Remains in Israel, which closely resemble modern humans, date back to about 120,000 to 90,000 years ago. There are tools found in Saudi Arabia and India, which date back as far as 100,000 years. And some teeth found in China are reported to be between 80,000 and 120,000 years old. So humans made it out of Africa. They made it pretty far. But the ones that are around these days, they came out much more recently. None of these people that I talked about are the ancestors of modern humans. So much to say, if there were humans that were here in the Americas 130,000 years ago, these are not the ancestors of modern humans um, that are still here, and further, they are not ancestors of any humans still living. 
So they're ancestors of what? So they would have perhaps been Neanderthals or some other extinct branch of humans. We have no genetic evidence of humans arriving in that time period, and until recently we have no archaeological evidence. So what is the strength of this latest evidence, and is it enough for us to question our established view? The study in question was published in the journal Nature in April 2017. The site we're talking about is the Sarudi Mastodon site in San Diego, California, which was found by construction workers in 1992. The site contains what they refer to as hammerstones and stone anvils found in close proximity to remains of a mastodon with fractured bones and molar fragments which seem to have been done soon after death. These can be radio dated at 130.7 thousand years, give or take 9.4 thousand years. The radio dating is pretty reliable. The remains were dated using uranium thorium dating, measuring the decay of uranium in the bones into thorium. This method is accurate up to 500,000 years, so the age of this particular mastodon isn't really in question. Many archaeologists, however, aren't convinced that the findings are evidence of early humans. What we're really talking about are mastodon remains crushed in a certain way and some boulders which may or may not have been tools. The researchers tried to prove that the stones were used as tools to crush the bones by replicating what would have occurred. They took similar rocks and used them to break apart fresh elephant bones, and the bones were fractured in a similar way to the mastodon bones. The rocks at the Sarudi Mastodon site also had scratch marks in them, similar to those found on the stones which struck the elephant bones. In this case, the early humans would have used these stones to try to get the marrow out of the mastodon bones, as has been shown at other archaeological sites. So we can ask ourselves if humans could have crossed the Bering Strait at that time. Dr. Beth Shapiro, a paleontologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, recently published a study showing that bison had spread into the Americas through the Bering Land Bridge around 135,000 years ago, which would match with the time these early humans might have crossed, so there is some plausibility to the idea. All that said, a lot of archaeologists are quite skeptical. Yes, these stones may have been tools used to crush the bones, but they may not be. The bones may have been crushed by other ways, and the stones may just be stones. This isn't the case of human remains being found, or an intact knife, or a clearly man-made tool being uncovered. It's rocks and crushed bones, both of which can exist without human interference. Adding to this the lack of any other evidence suggesting humans were in the Americas, let alone outside of Africa, we need to take this evidence for what it is. Vance T. Holliday, an archaeologist at the University of Arizona, had this to say. They present evidence that the broken stones and bones could have been broken by humans, but they don't demonstrate that they could only be broken by humans. Mm -hmm. Gary Haynes, an archaeologist of the University of Nevada, thinks the researchers should have ruled out more alternatives. He believes the bone fractures may have been caused by pressure from overlaying sediment. There is good evidence that there were humans in the Americas about 12 to 15,000 years ago. There is fairly questionable evidence of some form of human making it to San Diego further back by a factor of about 10 times, that being roughly 130,000 years ago. Crushed mastodon bones and boulders could be a sign of early humans, but this is not the only explanation for these remains. While this research is interesting and should prompt archaeologists to continue searching for similar evidence, it's far from the conclusive evidence we would need to put into question the existing body of knowledge about human expansion into the Americas. None of this even remotely suggests that the history as shown in Kyo Ryu Sentai Zero Ranger, adapted in North America as Power Rangers, which has humans living 170 million years ago, <laughs> living alongside dinosaurs, having access to a robot mammoth, known in the US series as a mastodon, which, like the saber-toothed tiger, is not a dinosaur and was not around 170 million years ago. Hashtag alternative facts. <laughs> <laughs> Great band, Mastodon. Pat and I went to see them a couple weeks ago. Well, I'm just happy that we brought in some some serious documentaries at the end. <laughs> yes, I like how it switched to like TV and then music at the end. Sure. The hallmark of good science. As I sit here in my red pants, I can't help but think I look pretty good. Christina, does wearing red make me more attractive? <laughs> Last week on TRC, Darren did a segment about whether car color affects insurance rates. He mentioned the notion that many people have had red cars are more likely to attract speeding tickets. 
Now, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, I don't want to spoil it for you, but the color red does seem to have its share of myths associated with it. Like, does red really make bulls angry? Or does your date find you more attractive if you wear red? Now, as far as bulls go, we know that's a quick debunk once you uh, know bulls are colorblind. But is there any science supporting the notion that wearing red makes you more attractive? Have you guys heard this? I, I've heard this and uh, a, a variant that a friend of mine uh, told me when I was in high school was that he used to wear bright colors because he believed that women would be drawn like they would be drawn to the color. They would notice it. And then when they would notice him, they would be confused and think that maybe they noticed him because they thought he was attractive. So that <laughs> was his strategy. I, I don't know if the, it made any sense, but he did okay. So He probably watched too many nature Planet shows. Earth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a needs to be uh, observed and then rejected. But if you don't get observed in the first place, you can't even succeed, right? Yeah, for sure. I I have heard this. I don't know if it's true, but I've definitely heard it. I thought it might be that you stand out more, similar to what Adam said, but not the mm-hmm. red itself. Mm-hmm. Well, there have been a bunch of studies claiming a link between wearing red and your desirability factor. But a couple of notable studies from 2008 and 2010 certainly lend credence to the claim. Co-authored by Andrew Elliott, a professor of psychology at the University of Rochester in New York, a 2008 study titled Romantic Red, Red Enhances Men's Attraction to Women, was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. The study tested U.S.-based male undergraduates who were shown various photos of women. The study's authors concluded that the males participating in the study consistently rated women substantially more attractive when they were wearing red, or there was red in the background of the photo. Elliot then co-authored a 2010 study titled Red, Rank, and Romance in Women Viewing Men, concluding the same applied for women rating men. And that study was published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Now, as we know here on TRC, any sassy science headlines that appeal to our own ideals or notions about fitness or health or sexuality are sure to stick out, especially if there is some potential for practical application in our day-to-day lives, right? Mm -hmm. And these studies certainly generated quite a few headlines, as you can imagine, including reputable magazines like Popular Science. And if you Google, does wearing red make you more attractive? One of the first things that pops up is an excerpt from a 2010 Psychology Today article highlighting Elliott's studies. The blurb reads, the results showed that men rated the women in red as more attractive and more sexually desirable than the same woman in blue. The results showed that men were significantly more attracted to the woman when she was against a red background. And then more studies supporting the connection have popped up, including another Elliott co-authored study in 2012. So, considering us humans have often associated the color red with passion or love, it's not a big stretch to believe there may be some truth to this. I mean, outside of being conditioned to associate red with sexuality, there are evolutionary or biological reasons suggested to support the theory. In the pop sci coverage of Elliott's study, they cite how red is a sexual cue in nature, stating, quote, Increased blood flow during ovulation allows female baboons, chimps, rhesus monkeys, and other non-human primates to display red coloration on their faces, genitals, and hindquarters, signaling to males that they're fertile and ready to mate. Hmm. The authors themselves wrote, quote, Red was used as early as 10,000 BCE in lipstick and rouge to mimic the red blush of sexual interest and excitation. Red has been used in mythology, folklore, and literature throughout the ages to represent sexual promiscuity and passion. And red has long signaled sexual availability in red light districts. End quote. As I said, we've been conditioned, right? I'm waiting for a but. But! Uh, (laughs) Less reported by media is the scrutiny these studies have come under, and there have been several follow-up studies trying to replicate these findings. Slate Magazine published an update about the claim just a few days ago, and that's what inspired me to cover this topic. Psychologists from Dominican University in Illinois have been trying to recreate the findings of previous research and publish their replication study just this month in Social Psychology. It's titled, Is Red Really Romantic? Two Pre-Registered Replications of the Red Romance Hypothesis. Pre-registered, hurrah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I thought you'd like that, Darren. Mm Mm-hmm. And guess what? They could find no correlation between wearing red and attractiveness. 
Robert Kalen Yegman and Gabrielle Lehman from the university's neuroscience department replicated the studies repeating the strongest experiment from Elliott's 2008 paper as closely as possible. To ensure rigor, not vigor, they obtained original materials, planned for informative sample sizes, pre-registered the study, as I mentioned earlier, used a positive control, and adopted quality controls. The study asked university students and online participants to rate the same photos used in Elliott's study, and yet the researchers could find little to no evidence supporting the original findings. Damn. Oh, snap. So although the scientists couldn't really offer a definitive explanation for the variation in their findings, they suggested a few reasons which seemed to be in line with issues raised as part of a replication crisis in science. First, there's often too much weight given to small samples. I mean, we've talked about this on the show many mm -hmm. times. Findings taken from a small group aren't necessarily representative of patterns in society as a whole. And in this case, the initial studies contained inadequate sample sizes. Mm. According to Kalen Yagman, they even used more participants than the original studies, specifically 600 participants compared to 150 mm. and 168 participants in Elliott's uh, first two papers. Another 2016 study in evolutionary psychology conducted three replications with more than 800 participants and also failed to support the original findings. Hmm. Then there's the unfortunate tendency to publish positive results, not negative ones. So we aren't exactly getting the whole picture. Yeah. As an example, when collecting data, Kalen Yagman uncovered more than half of all experiments involving women rating men hadn't even been published at all. The file drawer problem. Mm -hmm. As Slate mentions, the majority of published data include positive findings that support the effect working. Most unpublished findings show no effect. No. Scholarly journals may often reject papers with negative findings, and in the case of the Red Romance Connection, it seems studies showing no effect were ignored, while studies showing positive results were published. Says Kaylin Yagman, it seems clear that we're burying negative evidence. We should all work to stop doing that. He adds that researchers should put more effort into resubmitting rejected papers and replicating findings. In the meantime, Kalen Yugman's team is working on a yet unpublished meta-analysis, which they've shared with Professor Andrew Elliott. So far, the data accumulated shows no effect for women rating men and a weak effect for men rating women. You guys want to take a guess at Elliot's reaction to the new findings? Thank you so much for correcting my errors. <laughs> You'd hope, right? Yeah. Well, in an interview with Slate, he admitted that the sample sizes in his earlier studies were, quote, too small relative to contemporary standards. And he added, I have an inclination to think that red does influence attraction, but it is important for me to be open to the possibility that it does not. So good on you, science man. Good on him, mm. for sure. It's not bad. And uh, to your point, uh, Darren, um, you sounded really excited when I mentioned pre-registration. And the Center for Open Science in uh, Virginia have launched a pre-registration challenge, and they're paying academics a thousand bucks to incentivize them into pre-registering their papers. Cool. If you don't love science enough, let's pay you to love it more. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Thanks, Christina, and thanks for joining us once again. I told you that Ray Bradbury's book, Fahrenheit 451, is a pretty accurate depiction of when paper burns. Adam explored whether humans were in the Americas 130,000 years ago, and although there is some evidence indicating that might be the case, it can also be interpreted in a more mundane manner, and Occam's razor indicates it's probably not true then. And Christina showed us that while red may seem to be more appealing in various ways, good science shows that it does not make people more attractive. Until next time, think better to act better. Peace out, cuboids. Stay classy, not smartassy. Good night, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. For those who haven't read it, the book follows the 
look like the life. This is terribly written. Who wrote this? <coughs> Not Ray Bradbury. <laughs> 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 that nearly spinning his drink. Outtakes are already done. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it again if you'd like. No, you're fine. Just slow down. He's burning through this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> You know, it may not be true that uh, a woman who's in red is more attractive, but I definitely find it attractive when a woman is drenched in the blood of her enemies. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let's see, if, let's see if that stays in the show. <laughs> All right. You want to take a guess right. if that's going to stay in the All show? Right. <laughs>